All right, we're going to get started. This track is sponsored by NC Cardinal with live captioning made possible by Equinox Open Library Initiative. And we'd like to thank our captioner. We'd also like to thank the other conference sponsors for making this event possible, Mobius, Bibliomation, and Evergreen Indiana. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube following the conclusion of the conference. We'd like to encourage everyone to use the chat window to post questions. The facilitators will be collecting your questions along the way and posing them the, to the presenter at the end of the session or whenever they ask for questions. Your presenters for this session are Galen Charlton and Mike Rylander from Equinox, who will be talking about making Perl work for you in Evergreen. Okay, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for this uh, session uh, about uh, using Perl to write uh, new evergreen uh, services. Um, I will uh, start uh, by uh, talking uh, uh, about a, a couple housekeeping items and then uh, you know, hand it over to Mike. So during this uh, presentation, we will be grounding our example uh, in a specific uh, and timely case, namely a, a project uh, we took on to implement features in Evergreen to support curbside pickup services. Um, this uh, feature uh, includes uh, a lot of server-side uh, APIs. So we will be talking about the way that open source messages interact uh, with several services. And then we will uh, start uh, talking about the nitty gritty, uh, showing some of the boilerplate you need uh, to start up a new Perl service, writing a function, um, doing the mechanics of actually getting that service up and running and registered with open surf, talking a bit about streaming versus atomic method responses and uh, discussing uh, common tasks and tools. This will be a pretty fast uh, paced uh, presentation. We have a lot of slides um, and uh, only at this point 48 minutes. Um, so we will uh, try to make a tiny bit of uh, time uh, to answer questions, um, but uh, we may need to follow up after uh, the uh, presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike Rylander uh, to talk about uh, the story of uh, curbside. All right, well, hello everybody. Um, thank you, Galen. And I apologize in advance to our, um, uh, to our captioner. Uh, this will be pretty quick. Um, so as Galen said, we're gonna use the curbside service uh, that we've been working on for the last month as an example for how to create a Perl service for Evergreen uh, on top of the OpenSurf uh, infrastructure. Um, now to start off, uh, we received a few questions in early May uh, from libraries asking if there was some way to facilitate curbside pickup natively in Evergreen and there is not, uh, well, there was not. Um, so we surveyed what was out there today and we took a look at how five different libraries were doing curbside uh, now uh, uh, in, in uh, five different ILSs. Um, we did that, uh, Sally Fortin did that uh, over the course of a couple days in early May. And uh, it's of note that uh, one of the processes did involve using a bullhorn uh, standing in the doorway of the library. Uh, so we identified some critical properties that we wanted to, uh, if we were going to take this on and, and create some sort of curbside service uh, facilitation in Evergreen uh, that uh, we needed to make sure that uh, this service would fulfill. So we, we needed to make sure that we didn't uh, preclude any particular physical workflow or prescribe any specific workflow. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we did not change how holds and circulations work in Evergreen. 
we wanted to make sure that we were being as, as thin as possible. So we show staff just what is needed by patrons right now. Uh, and we show patrons just what they need in order to uh, facilitate the pickup of, uh, yes, <laughs> open analyst bullhorn, um, facilitate the pickup of items um, that they've requested a, pick, uh, a uh, curbside appointment for. We also wanted to make sure that this is entirely optional uh, so that you did not have to turn it on globally. Uh, each library can make its own decision about how to make use of this and to what degree. And, uh, and, and that goes within, goes, uh, that's true within a consortium, not just uh, across an entire Evergreen instance. And we wanted to make this as reportable as possible so that we could see how effective curbside pickup was, was for libraries. And of course, uh, bullhorns had to be supported. Uh, so we, we, we did a bit of a fe fe uh, feasibility assessment. Uh, we needed to make sure that we could get this done quickly because while uh, some states are starting to open up and some libraries are even starting to do uh, uh, in-person now, um, it, we don't know how long this, the entire uh, the, or the full curbside would be useful. Uh, and we needed to make sure that as libraries were starting to open up, they would have something to lean on and they didn't have to uh, re-architect their curbside pickup process halfway through uh, the reopening. Um, it took me about three and a half hours to do a first cut of the uh, core business logic um, on a Saturday afternoon. And that was based on the uh, initial assessment we had done uh, to see how people were trying to do curbside out in the world already. Uh, we needed to make sure that we could in fact uh, avoid touching hold and circulation business logic as it exists today. And we're, we've convinced ourselves that well, we can do that. And we needed to uh, make sure that we would be able to do this as seamlessly as possible for patrons. Uh, and uh, all three of those, uh, uh, all three of those criteria in the feasibility assessment, we we uh, convinced ourselves um, we succeeded. We can succeed on. So uh, yeah, on May sixteenth was when I did that initial proof of concept uh, of the some of the core APIs, not all of them. Um, on the twenty fifth, the uh, staff UI. Uh, was uh, substantially completed. And about the same time, we were able to pull together uh, a, a patron UI that um, gets that does not get in the way uh, of uh, any existing features and is directly linkable from outside so that we can um, push patrons to where they need to be when they need to be there. As a bonus, uh, one pain point in the OPAC, um, in some uh, areas of my OPAC, of the my OPAC area, is that there are tables that each row really wants to be a form, and uh, we uh, found a, uh, a mechanism to make that possible in HTML5 uh, uh, tables using uh, pure CSS. So now there's a way to uh, much more easily create uh, row-wide forms in tables uh, in the OPAC. Uh, so we have some code available for you now. Uh, there is a Git branch. Uh, it's linked off of a Launchpad bug. The bug number is embedded in that, uh, that Git branch name, uh, as you can see there. We do have a Concerto-based test server up and available for community testing. Uh, you can go there and pretend to be a patron or a staff member and see how it works. And there is a set of testing documentation for community testing at that shortened URL. Um, that has uh, not only some testing notes, uh, but also uh, staff and patron login information for, for testing purposes, as well as some initial documentation. Uh, part of the documentation we want to provide is uh, 
the uh, some some ways that you can make use of this uh, with different physical processes. Uh, some small libraries may have different um, needs than large libraries, so we wanted to outline a few different uh, usage scenarios so that uh, everybody would be able to have a, a starting point to design their uh, curbside service around. So we have gotten some feedback on the Launchpad bug as well as from internal testing and we have some ideas for future enhancement. Uh, we want to uh, add the ability for staff to claim appointments uh, so that uh, multiple staff can coordinate more easily within uh, a, a single building, uh, even if they're spread out uh, farther um, than just one CERC desk. Uh, we do want to uh, turn on, uh, or we want to, uh, we want to create um, uh, receipt triggering functionality right now. Uh, the curbside delivery does not uh, generate a receipt. Uh, you can go from the curbside interface to the patrons items out interface with a single click to click to uh, print out the items out list for the patron if they would like a uh, if they'd like a printed receipt but we want to also do, uh, do triggering of email receipts uh, in the long term we want to create a uh, a way to uh, let patrons signal they want to do curbside uh, at the time that they place holds so that when uh, when staff call a patron to inform them that their their items are available for pickup they the staff can be alerted that the patron would like to set a curbside time uh, right now curbside is based on the curbside times available to patrons are based on the hours of operation for the library uh, the idea being that the um, the hours of operation should re reflect the um, the times during the day when staff can interact with or when patrons can interact with the library. Uh, but we do want to create a mechanism for a separate uh, schedule for curbside availability uh, so that you can more easily do mixed mode both in in person pickup and curbside pickup. Um, and we want to enhance uh, the date and time restrictions a bit so that uh, patrons can't choose a date after their card has expired or after all of their holds on the hold shelf uh, would have expired from the shelf. And now we'll move on to how we actually did some of this. Uh, so we usually start off these types of uh, how to use Perl and Evergreen presentations with a discussion of OpenSurf and how it makes, uh, how it works and, and how all the pieces fit together. But really, 99% of the time, you do not have to care about it. And people always say, but wait, I want to know about this. Or, but wait, it's very big and scary. And there are lots of pieces to it. Um, and no, understanding all of the moving parts of OpenSurf can be beneficial, especially if you're writing a particularly complicated uh, set of services. But uh, in reality, you really never need to know about any of that uh, beyond the, uh, the basics of how to write, a, write some business logic and then uh, the few things you need to do to tell OpenSurf about your business logic. So you do have to have some basic boilerplate code. Um, this is uh, this is code that uh, this is Perl code that tells OpenSurf um, what the name of your application is, and uh, how uh, and and gives you some information, uh, or rather some tools to um, to interact with the rest of your application. Uh, beyond your single function that you're writing in this case. So I'll go through these. Uh, the 
the uh, the first line there, the package line, tells OpenSurf the name of the Perl module that it uh, should be loading to, in order to um, find the set of Perl code that it should run in re in response to requests from uh, from OpenSurf clients. It is a it is a, a good policy to always use strict and use warnings when you're writing an evergreen app or an open surf application and evergreen service uh, because that will allow you to get um, uh, that will allow Perl to tell you when you've made a syntax error or you've uh, forgotten to use the proper um, sigil on a variable or things like that. Um, in order to be able to talk to the rest of your application, you need to be able to create OpenSurf sessions. So you, you, you use OpenSurf app session. And in order to be an evergreen service, you need to uh, make your package, make your, um, make your new service a child service of the OpenILS application package. So you use OpenILS application and then you say use base open ILS application to tell uh, Perl that this module, this package is an open ILS application. The next three line use lines uh, are uh, useful utilities that you will need in almost all open surf applications that uh, exist inside of Evergreen. So it's a good idea to go ahead and put those in place. And then the next line, my dollar U, uh, that really just um, saves you from having to type that long name over and over and over again. Uh, you can, uh, anywhere that you need to get to an app utils function, you can say $u instead of that, the long package name. Programmers are lazy. Uh, the same basic idea happens with the OpenSurf utils logger. Uh, it creates a logger, um, a logger variable inside your package that can be used to write log lines out. Uh, very useful for debugging, very useful for um, providing information about when things go wrong in the logs so that you can come back and fix your code. And then the very last line in the package, uh, at the very last line of the file, is going to be a truthy value, the easiest thing to do is just put a one and a semicolon there. That is a requirement of Perl. Uh, the last line in a file needs to return true or Perl won't consider it has to have been compiled correctly. So writing a function. Uh, writing a function that's going to be used as an open surf uh, API call. Um, you're, it's, you need to be able to take input and there's a special convention. Um, you don't have to understand why, you just have to know it's always this way. When you write an open surf method or uh, API call, you're going to have to um, account for two magic inputs that you're always gonna get. The first one is the invocant. Um, that's the, the dollar self, that, uh, that variable um, that's passed in, that parameter that's passed in, tells uh, your, your function um, how it was called. Um, OpenSurf provides some information, which you'll see a bit more about later, about what the API name was, uh, whether or not um, this method was a streaming method. Uh, and in fact, you can uh, give extra information about the, um, uh, the context of that Call, uh, API call um, and uh, get a bit more um, inform you can make a bit more um, informed decision about how the method should act uh, based on uh, exactly how it was called. The connection object uh, generally called con dollar con in uh, evergreen applications is a way to, uh, to talk to whoever called us. Um, it is a, a link to the client and allows us to respond in several different ways. 
And then after that are simply the parameters that the caller passed to the, the request uh, when they initially made it. Uh, the, um, the parameters are, are uh, at, at this level, the parameters are just regular old Perl variables. You may get strings or numbers or whole objects uh, with uh, blessed types, but uh, you're just, uh, you're just, um, you're just going to get parameters like you would in any regular Perl function after the invocant and the connection object. So here we're seeing just how you can use those. As you can see, the self um, object, the, the self parameter is an object. It has an API name method on it. And it lets us tell in this particular case where we're creating or updating a curbside appointment whether we were called with an API name that uh, includes the string update and lets us decide which mode we're in. The connection object lets us uh, talk back to the users, or rather the client. Um, in this case, it's uh, just responding to the, uh, the, um, the client and moving on. And then we have the parameters they're passed in like regular. Um, most, most public services in Evergreen require an auth token to be passed as the first parameter. Um, there, we'll talk a bit more about the utility functions uh, and um, utility packages later, but they let you do things like uh, quickly check whether or not uh, a, the caller is authenticated. Uh, they let you ask what workstation they're at um, and they, uh, they let you test uh, who the user was that was logged in at that workstation, um, things like that. Uh, all right. So you wrote some business logic. You used the uh, parameters to um, to decide on how you want, or what you want to do and how you want to do it. And now you have something to return to the caller. Uh, you can just return it. Just like any Perl function, you can just return some data and it will go back to wherever uh, it was that uh, your, your sub was called. Uh, this is the simplest way to return something uh, in, in an open source service and uh, it, uh, it return, it's, uh, it's what you want to use when you have exactly one thing to return and uh, nothing more to do after you've sent that data back to whoever asked for it. But if you have more than one thing to return to the caller, such as uh, when you're returning a list of all of the potential curbside appointments that a user might have, you can return more than one by calling the respond method on the con object over and over again. Now, in other services where you may have a bit more you need to do in the middle of, um, or in, uh, for each of, the, each of the pieces of data you want to return, this can significantly reduce the time that it takes to get the first um, the the first res result back to the use to the caller uh, because the uh, the data is sent uh, back to the to the OpenSurf client immediately when you call respond with some caveats but we'll talk about those later uh, so you can have a complicated uh, method that uh, say fetches a hold and then goes and looks up a bunch of auxiliary information and calculates the position of the hold in the entire hold list. Um, and while it's doing that for the second one, it, it has already sent the first one off to the client and it can be processing it for display or um, requesting an update of the hold or doing all, all sorts of other things. And in this way, you can get some parallelism between the client and the server by having the server, uh, your, your business logic respond as quickly as possible um, to uh, a series with a series of um, of data. 
Now, there may be cases where you want to respond as quickly as you can, but then you have other things you want to do. Uh, so you can't return the data uh, using the Perl standard return uh, because you have stuff you want to do after that and returning exits the function or exits the sub. So in that case, uh, as we do when we're creating or updating a, uh, a curbside appointment here, we respond complete with the curbside uh, object uh, as it currently exists in the database. And then we go on and talk to the uh, to the action trigger service, which is called open ILS trigger. And we say, we need to go ahead and send them a new confirmation, um, a new confirmation message, either email or SMS. So we can send the, we can send the caller, the, the object, and then we can proceed to, to make the trigger call after we've already sent that. And, uh, we've gotten the data back to the caller as quickly as possible while uh, still being able to go on and do long running processes. Uh, this is used in other services in Evergreen uh, quite a bit. Uh, we do, we end up parallelizing a lot of search by doing this sort of thing. So you've written your function, or you've written your sub, and now you need to tell the world all about it. Um, it doesn't, uh, the OpenSurf doesn't know, magically know about every sub that exists in, in, a, uh, in a package because some of them may just be support functions that uh, let you keep from repeating yourself. So when you have a sub in a Perl package that's got all of the appropriate boilerplate, you need to tell OpenSurf about it uh, by using the uh, register method call. So you call register method and you pass it a set of parameters and register method it is a part of the OpenSurf infrastructure that tells the rest of the system um, about uh, methods that should be uh, published as API calls. And in order to tell uh, register method of uh, which of the um, uh, which of the subs you've written are in fact uh, the uh, business logic you want to expose as an OpenSurf API or new Evergreen um, API, you uh, tell it the name of the sub with the method uh, parameter. Um, that you'll recall that create update appointment was the name of the sub in the package that we saw as one of the earlier examples. And then you want to give it an API name. Now you give it an API name because there's no reason that multiple packages can't have subs with the same name. So we want to be able to name our APIs separately from the sub in the package. Uh, this also separates the way that Perl thinks about the names of things from the way that OpenSurf does, so that OpenSurf doesn't have to be just Perl. We have C, we have, uh, C services. Uh, we, you could conceivably have um, Python or Java services, um, although I think Java got removed recently. Uh, but different languages uh, name things in different ways. So we remove the language specific part of that. And uh, at the convention in Evergreen is to name the API, uh, to use, the, use an API name that starts with the uh, name of the service. So the service is called open-ils.curbside. We have a, um, an API name called open-ils.curbside.updateAppointment rather than simply update appointment. And then, and this is, uh, this is, this is uh, very important for code hygiene. You wanna provide a signature. Now, there's nothing by default that the signature um, does 
actively in the code itself, but it is very important uh, to provide a signature uh, for a few different reasons. Uh, and the way you provide the signature is with the signature, param the signature parameter um, is a hash with one key of that hash being the params. Uh, that's a, and then that is in, in turn uh, a, an array ref of hashes and each of those describes what the parameter is. So you recall the first parameter past the invocant and the connection object was the, uh, the auth token parameter. We give it a type and a, and a description. A type is string because it's a, it's a, uh, essentially an MD5 sum hash. Um, and then the patron ID is a number. Uh, and the uh, date and time are strings because we don't have special types uh, at the Perl level for, for dates and times specifically. Uh, and then the library ID which defaults to wherever the logs, wherever the um, workstation is, or where the user's home library, if they're not at a workstation. Um, and uh, all of those um, typed and described parameters can be used in, in, uh, in ways which we'll see in a minute. Uh, and then finally, you want to tell OpenSurf about what is going to come back from your function. In this case, and you do that using the return parameter to the, or the return key to the signature parameter. Uh, in this case, we just describe what will come back. Um, and uh, it will be a, a curbside object or a curbside appointment object. Uh, if everything went well, uh, if there was an error that we could detect, then we will return that error. Uh, and if, if, uh, bad, if we get some bad data, then we return nothing because we don't want to talk to you. You're just going to be silly. So why do we do the signature? Uh, the most important reason is really that it's being kind to other developers that are going to come along and take a look at your code because having that inline documentation in a known structure is very helpful. It makes it uh, very quick to look up how one should use those, those functions. Second is that there is in fact a, a documentation generator um, and uh, it works for any public open source application. Um, well, it would if the, uh, if the XSL did in fact work, but modern browsers have broken it. So uh, I'll be looking at how to unbreak it going forward, hopefully. And the, the last reason, and this doesn't apply to Evergreen per se, because we have never made use of it, but OpenSurf does provide a strict mode that will check the parameters coming from, uh, from a uh, coming in on a request from a client to make sure that there are, there are enough of them and to make sure that they are the correct type. And if they're not, it will reject the request uh, up front without ever going to your code. It's a way to, uh, to uh, protect your code from bad data coming in or malicious data. And finally, uh, we talked earlier about the, uh, the uh, respond method on the connection object. Uh, if you're going to call it more than once and uh, you want to be able, you want your clients to be able to uh, decide whether they want to wait for everything or get or get uh, the responses as quickly as possible, then you should uh, mark the method as streaming. Uh, if you do that by saying stream true, stream is and one is true in Perl, then a special, uh, then register method will actually call itself, creating a second registration uh, for this, for uh, this API uh, and it will change the name of the API so that it ends in dot atomic. That will, uh, that will be, um, well, we'll be seeing a bit more of that in a, in a minute, but uh, that will let the caller decide what the best way to talk to your API is for their particular 
situation. And with that whirlwind out of the way, uh, I will pass it back to Galen for uh, a big chunk of the remainder. Okay, uh, thank you, Mike. So uh, if you've uh, been following uh, along um, uh, with uh, Mike, what you now have uh, is uh, a parcel of Perl code that does uh, something. Um, but the next uh, step is to tell the application, in this case, Evergreen, that it exists. So I will go through some of the mechanics of taking your fancy new Perl service uh, and hooking it up. Um, the first test step uh, is in the configuration file opensurf.xml, adding a definition to uh, the service uh, in uh, the apps uh, section. So opensurf uh, XML um, will expect uh, an element uh, by convention. It's given the same name as uh, the service, uh, open-ios.curbside. Uh, as well as some uh, parameters uh, saying um, what it is and where to find it. So the part that's highlighted, the implementation is the name of uh, the Perl module uh, that we've uh, just uh, created. And we know it's Perl because the language element uh, is uh, set to Perl. Now, had this uh, been a C application, the language would be entered as C and the implementation would be pointing a, uh, to a path uh, uh, to a uh, C shared library. Um, some of uh, the other settings of interest, I won't go through all of them now, uh, include things like max requests, uh, that is saying how long, how many requests should an individual drone or worker for open iOS curbside process uh, before it exits. Uh, this uh, can be useful uh, for, uh, you know, dealing with potential memory leaks, as well as settings like max and min children and min spare children and max uh, spare children, saying how many backends uh, you expect uh, the server to need. Uh, in this case, application, you know, open iOS curbside wouldn't be a tremendously overloaded service. Um, so the default of min one, max 15 should uh, apply uh, to um, most instances. Um, it might uh, need uh, to have max children set a bit uh, higher uh, for large uh, consortia. So we have uh, defined the service uh, in open uh, surf.xml. But then you also have a decision uh, to make uh, whether to make this uh, service be accessible uh, through the public uh, open surf router. Making it public has a couple implications. A public service uh, can be accessed uh, through uh, and, uh, things like uh, the WebSockets uh, gateway uh, or uh, one of the various uh, JavaScript uh, or HTTP translator gateways. Uh, and a public service, therefore, inherently either needs to ensure that each of its uh, methods uh, require an auth token, or if, like, say, the version check, it doesn't matter if uh, any random uh, client uh, invokes that API, you could uh, forgo the auth check. But most uh, public services will require authentication. Um, if you don't make a uh, service uh, public, it's still available, but only through the private router. And for private uh, services, they can be invoked uh, by other services. Uh, they can be accessed uh, by, um, you know, TPAC, uh, but uh, they're otherwise not uh, directly uh, callable uh, from uh, the outside world. So now that we've said where the service is, and in this case, that we, we want it to be publicly accessible, um, there's um, a bit more to actually get it running. So one mechanical question, where the heck do you put uh, your module? Um, in the source tree, it would go under your repo, 
then open iOS, source, Perl mods, lib, and then in, the, uh, in this case, open iOS slash application, and then finally curbside.pm. Now, while you're going through the process of developing the, the service, um, rather than using the full make install dance, you can put yourself in the Perl mods directory and run build uh, install uh, anytime you need uh, to <coughs> update uh, the service as uh, you're coding. Then to actually run or restart uh, the service, uh, you can, as the open surf user, use the OSurf control script uh, to um, you know, start, uh, stop, or restart the service. And if the Perl code um, is actually a TPAC by Perl handler, um, you wouldn't use OSurf control. Instead, you would reload uh, Apache 2 uh, to um, you know, uh, use uh, the latest and the greatest uh, open iOS web, web, web uh, code that you put in. So, um, because I like that you live uh, dangerously, um, we will take a pause uh, from the slides uh, to uh, do a live uh, demo. Please cross uh, your fingers uh, for me. So, what I'm uh, going to do uh, is uh, to demonstrate um, the example of uh, what Mike uh, meant by streaming versus atomic uh, methods. So I've opened up uh, a surf uh, shell session and I'm going to go ahead and log in. I should point out that uh, if you're used uh, to just log in uh, username and password uh, in surf shell, there's a uh, longer form where you can say, in addition to the password, the type of login, in this case, a staff, uh, the org unit, and the workstation. So now that we have an auth token, I will first use it uh, to call one of the curbside methods in a streaming fashion. And what you're seeing from surf shell is that it's receiving the data one object at a time. However, if I tack on atomic to the name of the method, it receives data only once. And that's because the atomic wrapper is collecting off the streamed uh, output and uh, sticking it into uh, an array. So the client, rather than getting a sequence uh, of objects, uh, would be getting a single object uh, that's uh, an array. So now that uh, we have uh, survived uh, the uh, live demo, we'll uh, jump back uh, to uh, the slides and we will ignore the backup uh, slide. And let's uh, go talk about some of uh, the things that you would commonly want uh, to do uh, in a Perl uh, method. So one thing you might want to do is to call a method in another service. Um, so the top example is a one-shot uh, request. Um, we're using app session. We're creating a, a connection uh, to the open iOS trigger, trigger service uh, and passing in one request. Uh, in this case, um, you know, we're connected to trigger. So we uh, give it um, the uh, name, you know, the parameters uh, of the API name and then additional, uh, uh, additional parameters. So that's a one shot uh, request. Um, we can also uh, get, do multiple requests. So the example below, we're using app session to connect uh, and that makes a persistent uh, connection to open iOS a CERC. And then what we're doing here is uh, for each hold in our holds, uh, you know, uh, array ref, we're saying, let's go ahead uh, and make uh, an open iOS CERC checkout uh, you know, request uh, to actually check out uh, the item associated uh, with that hold and uh, to, as far as possible, uh, ignore uh, conditions uh, that uh, would prevent checkout. And then for each of them, um, we're 
you know, gathering all the requests, uh, you know, responses, and, you know, putting them uh, together and uh, returning the entire lot of checkout responses to our client. And then before we forget, uh, we uh, will disconnect uh, from open iOS uh, CERC. Now, sometimes uh, the method you want to call is in the same service uh, you're writing code uh, for. So this is a CERC example. Um, calling self method lookup is the saying, I have an open surf API name. Please uh, find and give me a reference uh, to the sub that implements it. And then, you know, with that, um, you know, I can uh, then invoke run, which will um, pass in the same self and the connection, uh, as well as any other parameters that you specify. Now, why would you do this? Sometimes it's just a matter of, uh, uh, avoiding the uh, overhead of uh, XMPP. And sometimes you need to guarantee that actions take place in the same process with the example of a WinOS storage transaction commit being a good one. Since uh, each OpenOS storage backend has a database connection, um, if you want to do a transaction uh, in OpenOS storage, you have to make sure that the same process that issues uh, the uh, transaction begin is the same process uh, that issues uh, the uh, commit. Otherwise, uh, the database will be very confused. Uh, another aspect is uh, events. Um, an event is uh, just uh, a, a way of uh, passing uh, data about an erroneous uh, condition. Um, in a special structure uh, that uh, the Evergreen clients uh, recognize. Uh, and this is, um, so, you know, events uh, are defined in iOS events.xml. Uh, they have a number, a code, and a description. And if you run into something where um, your sub cannot proceed further, you can go ahead and uh, return an open iOS event object um, either directly or through uh, C store uh, editor, and uh, the client uh, will, you know, have information about the exception that it uh, will hopefully uh, know how to deal with. Um, Mike mentioned uh, the app utils. Uh, app utils is a package uh, that has uh, a grab bag of uh, functions like is true, uh, which uh, tries to bring that together all of the various ways uh, that you can say true, including uh, T uh, and F, uh, you, know, you know, utilities uh, to check uh, permissions, or uh, the shortest uh, way of making an open source request uh, of another service, uh, the simple rec uh, uh, method, uh, which um, you pass it the name of the service, uh, the name of the API, any parameters, uh, and then uh, it, uh, it takes care of making the request, gathering the responses, and sending it uh, back uh, to you. So that brings me to C Store Editor. C Store Editor is a, uh, in part, a wrapper uh, around Open iOS C Store, the service. Um, it's a utility uh, you know, class uh, that rather than having to manually put together uh, C store requests will let you start a new editor, um, you know, specify authentication, um, uh, your auth token, indicate if you want to run everything in a single transaction. Um, it has utility methods like check auth uh, to verify whether your auth token is valid. Um, but the core of it that makes it C store ish is, is uh, it uh, comes with a lot of auto-generated methods from the IDL that, that, that you do database actions. Like in this case, search uh, the action curbside uh, table based on various uh, parameters and get uh, results uh, back. Field mapper uh, is uh, the uh, set of uh, Perl classes that take uh, the IDL uh, and uh, generate uh, you know, uh, Perl classes. That's what uh, makes it possible for you to say, um, 
you know, rather than hand uh, constructing uh, SQL uh, to get an object representing a database row, set values, uh, and then update it uh, in this case uh, yeah, via C store calls. You will see a lot of the field mapper, both the server side, uh, as well as, uh, you know, uh, equivalent, uh, you know, helper, uh, IDA uh, helpers uh, client side. So this is, I promised to you there was a lot uh, in uh, this uh, presentation. So for a very quick uh, recap, um, we talked about a specific example. Uh, we talked very briefly about uh, OpenSurf and where Perl services uh, fit into it. And then we went through the process of setting up a new Perl Evergreen service writing the code, registering at the method, deploying at the method, um, calling other methods, uh, and then discussing uh, some uh, utilities uh, for it. So this uh, takes us uh, to uh, our 50 minutes. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, your uh, time uh, and attention. Um, and I see one question from Tiffany uh, that I can expand upon anyway, uh, expand upon. Um, in my demo, why did I need to specify uh, the login type and workstation? Um, that's uh, because the open iOS curbside methods uh, for the most part assume that you have a workstation because that uh, tells it uh, whether curbside is enabled at that library. Um, and if you just log in to Surfshell without specifying a workstation, it, the login session it uh, creates has no workstation. And without a workstation, most uh, OpenLOS curbside uh, methods would uh, abort uh, complaining uh, about a lack of a workstation library. So thank you uh, for this uh, whirlwind. Um, we're at uh, our time limit, um, but uh, we'll be happy to uh, take uh, questions uh, via IRC or the open iOS set of the mailing list. Whew. So, thanks again. Thank you, Galen. Thank you, Galen. Thank you Mike. <laughs> Great job.